my name is Dave Sina. I'm the chair for CD4, and Congressional District 4 is ho hosting this forum tonight. And so I want to welcome you. Thank you for coming out. Uh, thank you for coming out instead of watching or going to the Vikings game. So it shows where your priorities are, so we appreciate that. Uh, before I do get started, I would just like, uh, like us to uh, give a warm welcome to our candidates here that are here tonight and thank them for participating in this forum. I guess one thing that we should say, or I'd like to say anyway, about any person running for political office, it takes a lot of time, energy, and sacrifice. So we are really grateful for these, for these men here to put their hat in the ring, to want to run for this office. It's a, it's a tough thing to do, but we appreciate their, their service and their effort. So thank you guys. Uh, one other thing I'd like to um, just if you are an elected official at any capacity, whether you're at the city level, state level, federal level, uh, county level, would you please stand so we could acknowledge you if you are currently in office? Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to start tonight. Uh, Senator Roger Chamberlain is going to be our moderator. Uh, we're uh, First of all, we're going to... I have to say the Pledge of Allegiance, and then we're going to have Pastor Tim, who is the principal here of Concordia Academy, lead us in an invocation. Uh, we're going to have the national anthem sung by some of their students, and then we're going to have uh, Jennifer Carnahan, who is our new state party chair, address us for a couple minutes, and then we'll be getting into the forum. So would you all stand, please, and we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would you please uh, st stay uh, standing, please, while we have uh, Pastor Tim come up and give the invitation. Just on behalf of all of Concordia Academy, again, welcome this evening, special welcome to our, our candidates here. Uh, and again, it's my privilege to open with a word of prayer, and I would invite you to pray with me. Father, we just thank you for this beautiful evening, Lord, and on this evening, we thank you for our great country, and we thank you for our state. Father, we ask your blessing on this evening, and as we practice healthy public discourse, uh, may you be in our discussions, and our talk, and our thoughts, Lord, uh, as we seek to be responsible stewards of the incredible gifts and opportunities and responsibilities that you have given to us as your people. To that end, we ask your blessing on this evening. To that end, we invoke your name this evening as we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Welcome. This time, I'd like to invite forward uh, members of one of our singing groups as they just come from practice and sports and run here to uh, join us this evening and lead us in the singing of our national anthem. This is, group is called His People. Thank you very much, that was beautiful. 
Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce our new state party chair. Well, she's not new so much anymore. Uh, Jennifer Carnahan, where are you? Uh, there she is. Okay. Jennifer, she would like to uh, address our group for a couple minutes, so thank you. Good evening. I won't take up much of your time because I know everybody's here to hear the governor candidates. But I just want to share a quick update. Um, since we've come together as a new leadership team since the election on April 29th, we've been focused on working together across three key priorities for our state. Number one, we're working to build a strong financial war chest for 2018. We're continuing to work on reducing and eliminating the debt. And lastly, we're focused on building a strong organization from top to bottom and side to side. And I'm proud to say that in the first four months since we've come together as a new team, We've done just that. We've reduced our debt by another 10%. We've been able to cut our operating mon monthly operating expenses by 15%, and we're starting to build our financial war chest and are at a point where we have over six figures sitting in the bank right now. And from an organizational structure, <laughs> and from an organizational structure, we're bringing in top talent and we've got our new executive director, Matt Pagano, here tonight. He is one of the brightest political minds in this state, and adding him to the Minnesota GOP is going to be incredible and important to achieving the great victories we need to hit in 2018. Republican prospects in Minnesota have never been this bright in the past decade. We are coming off a very successful 2016 election year and have a great momentum and tide to turn as we enter 2018. We have the focus of the national groups on Minnesota. In August, I was out at the RNC summer meeting in Nashville and they lifted up Minnesota as a tier one state that will be focused on from a national perspective with heavy financial and human resource um, investments. We will be getting a state director. We will be getting a data director and we'll be able to build out a strong field game to help our candidates from top to bottom in 2018. So we're very encouraged by that. And I'll end with this. From the gubernatorial race, we all know that this is the critical race in 2018. We have to win this in Minnesota. Losing this race would have been like if Hillary Clinton would have been elected to president. And that is not something the country could have taken. And that's certainly not something Minnesota can take. Why it's so important is our governor candidate will have the ability to redraw um, the district lines in 2020. We would have total control of the legislature and also we'll be able to start moving and pulling back on some of what the Democrats have done over the past eight years and move forward with a common sense conservative agenda. So I'm just excited and honored that we have such incredible candidates that are out early working hard to earn your vote and earn your support and running to champion our values and message. And I'm confident that no matter who comes out with the endorsement, we will all need to work together and get behind that endorsed candidate immediately and make sure we all push that candidate over the finish line. So I think tonight will be a great forum and uh, that's just the update from the state party. Thank you. Jennifer for those good words. Uh, now we're going to start our forum and uh, we'll get on with that. And Senator Roger Chamberlain is our moderator for the evening. Senator Chamberlain represents Senate District 38, which includes Lionel Lakes, Hugo, Centerville, White Bear Lake. What am I missing? A lot of them. A lot of them. Anyway, that northern <laughs> tier of cities. Uh, Senator Chamberlain, he'll be our moderator. And so I'm going to turn it over to Senator Roger Chamberlain. Good evening. First, thanks to Concordia Academy again, and thank you to the candidates. And sometimes I don't need the mic. And we have to thank CD4 for uh, doing this. This is not easy stuff, so thanks for the volunteers for coming together and doing that. And, um, uh, and thank all of you for being here on football night, but I didn't want to remind you of that. So, but, um, so we're going to start this quick. So we're going to have, as you know, there's going to be an opening statement. We each get three minutes. And we'll have, we picked four questions and from the list that you were sent. We'll have two minutes each to do those. Um, then you'll have a closing statement. Three minutes for that as well. Um, we... We'll also be very strict on that. 
you want to get to questions from the audience, if we have enough time, we'll take three questions from the audience. So we'll be strict on the time. You can see our timekeeper here because he can't be missed. He's in red. <laughs> Raise your hand, wave. Right there. You'll see him. He's in red. Um, if you have questions you'd like to submit, hopefully we can get three. We're going to get two for sure. Uh, raise your hand and we have a couple of people out here who will pick up those note cards. Uh, right there, okay, these two folks standing up there will take the note cards. Okay, So we'll pass them up. If you have questions, they will take the note cards from you. And I think I've covered everything I need to cover for that. Um, we want to have a lively, robust discussion. I think everybody here, as we go on, want to know who you are, why you want to do this crazy thing, what makes you tick? What is it that puts you up out of bed in the morning to come and do this sort of stuff? All right? So with that, now we drew, we had a non, a complete non-partisan young lady pull the name out of the jar, right? We did it officially, we had six people. So to start, we uh, pulled out, let's see, Senator Dave Osmond, Dave, Mr. Osmond, Mr. Osmond. Uh, he'll start and we'll just go around. Whoever's then at the end, uh, Mr. Parrish will give you the, the start since we'll be last. So that's the first closing statement. The other questions, I think uh, we'll just start with Mr. Dean and go around with that's okay with everybody. Right? So with that, we have covered all the business. If we haven't, I'll interrupt and say I do so. So, Mr. Osmond, you get to go. First three minute statement. Ready, timer? Yeah. All right, there you go. Well, good evening, and uh, if you're like me, I've had my heart broken by the Vikings so many different times, it doesn't make matter if I miss one little quarter or a couple of quarters. So, I'm State Senator Dave Osmick. Uh, I live in Mound, Minnesota. Uh, originally, I uh, was born in Glencoe, Minnesota, which is about an hour and a half west of here. Uh, came home to my grandparents' farm where I lived on a trailer with my parents for the first couple of years. Moved into Bisky, where the largest industry was their liquor store and eventually went to St. Cloud State University and now I reside on the west, west side of Lake Minnetonka with my wife and my two daughters. So, good to see you here tonight. Why am I running for governor? I'm running for governor because I think we need a fighter in St. Paul. We need to have somebody that's going to shake up St. Paul as Tr President Trump has shaken up Washington. You may not necessarily agree with everything, that President Trump says, or everything that President Trump does, but you will admit this, the dynamic has changed. The narrative has changed. We have to do the same in St. Paul, because every time you go to St. Paul, you hear the same thing from the Democrats and the same thing from the, from the media. I'm sorry to be redundant, but they're the same people. They say the same things. You can't do things. You can't do that. We need people that are going to follow, have a candidate who's going to follow the party platform and honor that platform. I'm running on a number of different issues. My first issue, primarily, is getting rid of the Metropolitan Council. Now, for those of you who live in the Metropolitan area, you know how bad these people are. They are an unelected, unaccountable body who continues to take away power from cities and counties, manipulate their planning, and build something that we have to get rid of also, which is Southwest Light Rail. Did you notice that they opened the bids today on Southwest Light Rail? And they found out that the bids came in too high. Well, gee whiz, no kidding, it's only going to get worse. It's the most expensive public works project in the history of this state. That's another thing I'm gonna get rid of, and when I had my, my opening statement, uh, in front of the press a couple of weeks ago, they said, well, what do you think about Southwest Light Rail? I used one word, dead. The second thing I said was, and by the way, before you ask me about Botno, that's dead too. We have got to start investing in roads and bridges. We have got to invest in a candidate who's willing to, willing to be upfront and not be Minnesota nice. I think we have a bunch of great candidates that can do the job. I think I can come to the, to the table with a little different attitude. It's something that Senator, uh, Senator Chamberlain has on his desk. Passion, but not anger. We need to have that candidate that can take our message to the Democrats, not back down, and continue to fight for what we believe in, and I think I can be that, that candidate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
And thanks everybody for being here tonight. Thank you CD4 for putting this on and for all the great work that you do. Uh, Dave and Candy, all of the folks in CD4 do a super job. I'm really proud of all of the work that was done in the last election. Uh, in our area with uh, RBPOU Senate District 38, uh, really did I think a fantastic job, not in just getting ourselves taken care of uh, and then assisting other passengers uh, when we had our own oxygen masks firmly secured. Uh, so we were able to go out and help some adjoining folks. Uh, Randy Jessup, who I think I saw skulking around in the back. Uh, we had some other, other races that were really, really close. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that people did in CD4 to help us and also help others. We came very, very close in a couple of races and uh, in Sharna's and Candy's and others. We're going to be there next time, and I really appreciate all of the work that was done. I've really got a great feeling for where we're heading in Minnesota right now, and after getting through a really tough session with Mark Dayton, who I like more than he likes me, uh, kind of got, felt like I fell down a flight of stairs, got into the summer, went to the fair, and you know what? This state is heading in a great direction, and I really felt every day like, you know what, I think we're heading in the right direction. You wouldn't know it if you pick up a, a newspaper or you turn on the television, uh, but we really are heading in the right direction. After the, after the fair, I started a tour of 87 counties in 87 days, and I headed up to Crookston. I visited my daughter at college. And we were heading up to Warren, Minnesota, and I was going to meet with a group of activists up there, and the tire blows out on the car. You know, what are you going to do? You're about five minutes away. So it's 2017. You get on Facebook. You say, hey, Warren, I'm going to be a little late. Hang tight. You know, we're just, we got a little flat. It's going to be okay. So about seven minutes later, a truck pulls up and says, which one of you is Matt? And I said, I am. He said, somebody saw on Facebook you had a flat, called me, told me to get you and drag you into Warren. <laughs> so I said, all right. So I jump in the truck and I'm thinking, this is a great state. What a great state we live in. And then I thought, I just climbed in a truck with a complete stranger in the middle of nowhere who found out I was here from the internet. And then I said a prayer. But I wound up in Warren, things are good, and we live in a great state. I love Minnesota. I was born on the Iron Range. I grew up on Rice Street. I'm a fifth generation Minnesotan. I married Laura, the best thing I ever did. Uh, was Mary the girl I met in kindergarten and Rice Street and we've got three great kids two in college one at home The kid in college is so great even took one of my dogs So our nest is even a little emptier along with her to college. So now down to one dog uh, We're doing a great uh, great thing and and just raising our family and saying what are we gonna do next? I look out and I say we got a lot of opportunities in this great state of Minnesota but we got a lot of challenges too. And we can, we can meet those challenges as our party if we have the right candidates with the right message working hard enough. I've said I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to put myself out there, get a great team in all eight congressional districts to do that. And I need your help. It's gonna be a fun, Mr. fun. Mr. Dean, oh. I hate to, I have to be important. Roger. You must pass on. You got it. you got it. I'm sorry, eight. Alex, I can barely see it. So eight, I, eight, I, I wasn't ignoring you, Alex, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Mr. John. Um, thank you for yielding your time to me, Matt. I appreciate it. Thank you all. I want, to share the same, I want to share the same thanks that everybody else will for all that you do. I appreciate it. I'm Jeff Johnson. A little about my background. My wife, Sandy, and I both spent about the first half of our lives in northwestern Minnesota, uh, Crookston, Detroit Lakes, and Moorhead. And now we've spent the second half essentially in Plymouth. We have two teenage boys, Thor and Rolf. We got a bulldog named Chester. Uh, I have had my own business for about 16 years, and during that time, I also served a few years in the house way back when, and am now the often lonely voice of uh, sanity in the heart of the beast on the Hennepin County Board. <clears throat> and I'm running for governor, and I'm running for a really simple reason, to take power away from government and to give it back to the people of Minnesota. Everybody in this room knows what the mantra of government is today. They know best how we should spend our money and live our lives. What sort of health care we should have, how we should commute to and from work, how big our lots should be, how we should raise our kids. That will change when I'm governor of Minnesota because it's none of government's dang business and it's worth a fight. And let me tell you just a few of the ways that I'll do that as governor. We're going to 
cap property tax increases and we're going to eliminate state mandates on our schools and state regulations on our businesses. We are going to aggressively fund roads and bridges and a good bus system and we are just as aggressively going to defund every 19th century form of transportation that's all the rage with the liberals right now, including light rail and commuter rail and streetcars and anything else they come up with next. We are going to welcome with open arms anybody who wants to come here legally and work next to us to achieve the American dream, but we will ban sanctuary cities in the state of Minnesota because they don't belong here. We're going to push for term limits. We're going to put an end to some of the huge corporate subsidies we've been seeing in this state the last 20 years. And after a 57% increase in state spending the last eight years, I'm not interested in slowing the rate of growth and calling that a victory. We will actually reverse that trend and start to shrink the size, scope, and cost of government for real. And one last thing, because this is closest to my little Hennepin County heart, I'm, I'm fighting this every day. I will fire the Met Council and replace that beast once and for all, not because that's the biggest problem in Minnesota, but, but because it's symbolic of the biggest problem in Minnesota. This belief that there are really two classes of people, a ruling class and the rest of us that need their advice. So I, I look forward to talking to you about some of the other things that I will be discussing during the campaign and why I believe I'm the strongest candidate, and I hope to earn your support. Thank you. Well, I'm Keith Downey, and I want to echo the uh, thanks for uh, the 4th Congressional District and, and all your work. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later on about how the 4th is actually, I think, one of the paths to victory for us on the Republican side in the governor's race and the importance of this area. So thank you for hosting this, Dave and team, and thank you everybody for coming on out. I want to start by asking three questions. Have you ever been concerned that your kids will not stay in Minnesota? Have you ever been concerned that maybe your parents might not stay in the state of Minnesota? Have you yourself question whether you can stay in the state of Minnesota. I'm getting the exact same reaction from the people in the audience here that I got every single day at the State Fair when I asked people that question. I grew up here. I had a wonderful opportunity. Uh, tremendous uh, uh, education and wonderful opportunities to succeed in business. And I look across this state and I see really good people doing what they have always done in Minnesota and not finding a path, and not seeing their opportunity here in Minnesota anymore. And so I think we run, as Republicans, on a very simple and clear message. We have to make Minnesota work for everyone. And it's not. For a lot of us, yes, but the trend lines are not positive. We're shedding jobs. We're shedding private sector jobs. Our economy actually shrank in the second or in the last quarter of 2016 and the first quarter of 2017. Think about that. Our economy contracted in Minnesota. We are creating social service and education jobs, not private sector jobs. And people out across this state, whether you're a miner up on the range who just wants a job, whether you're a farmer uh, out in greater Minnesota who just wants the MPCA and the DNR off their back, whether you're a small business owner uh, who is crippled by the cost of Obamacare and what's happening, we have to stand up and fight. I think there are three key things in this election in terms of policy. The first is to reinvigorate our private sector business climate. The second is we have got to offer choices to people who are locked in failing schools or schools who are coming at them, coming at their kids and their families with this progressive left agenda. And we have to shrink the size and the intrusiveness of state government. All that having been said, I can tell you from what I sensed out at the state fair and what I hear from the people around this state, more important than anything, this election cycle, Republicans have got to stand on the side of the people. My fundamental message to the people of Minnesota is that I believe in you. And I trust Minnesotans, not bigger government, for our future. We have a chance to restore this state if we knuckle down and do the hard work 
But we aren't going to do it unless the people know that we're on their side. The energy from 2016 in the electorate has not dissipated. If anything else, I think it's intensified. We have to go out, prove to people we're on their side, we care about them, and we're going to fight for them. And that's what I'm going to do if, if I'm your governor. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you. Uh, the opportunity to be here is so, uh, so humbling because all of you that I've seen throughout the state, uh, some of you, many of you I've seen already this year since April, I've been out uh, getting around the Minnesota quite a bit. And the more I get to know you, the more I'm impressed I am with all of you and how hard you're working to make sure we get this right. So I'm Philip Parrish, and last December, I was sitting there in my, not a barracks, it was actually a hotel, but in my last set of orders, and I'm starting to research, well, who's gonna run for governor? Who's gonna take this on? Who's gonna talk about the real issues? And at the time, I couldn't find anybody that I really could get excited about. So I talked to my wife and got excited and got out here and started to talk to you and we're gonna get this done. So I'm Philip Parrish. I was born and raised in Southern Minnesota, born in Blue Earth, raised in West Concord. I grew up uh, in a farm community and I went to college to become a teacher. I taught school for over 13 years, became an administrator. I specialize in emotional behavioral disorders. In the midst of that, I joined the Navy. I joined the Navy as an intelligence specialist and I served as a Navy intelligence specialist while being a teacher and principal. And about nine years, nine and a half years later, I received a direct commission, and I accepted that direct commission as an intelligence officer. 2003 came along, I was deployed. 2005, I was deployed. 2008 came along, and I was deployed, and I never made it back. <laughs> I was overseas for quite a while, and uh, just this last set of orders, believe it or not, they deployed me to D.C., of all the places. In that job, I found some very interesting issues that I had known about, but I wasn't as passionate about as I am now. In those opportunities, I saw some concerns about Minnesota. You might ask, well, why would military orders and counterterrorism and foreign policy have anything to do with Minnesota? Well, why is because you're being exploited. You're being lied to. My family and friends are being lied to and exploited. And I've had enough of it. I'm not the kind of person that can just go home and shut the door, forget about what I saw, forget about what I read, forget about what's going on. And those kinds of things motivate me and keep me up at night. I'm here to try and help. I'm here to represent you. I will represent you with every ounce that I've got and then some. And I will not come off that field until you have to carry me on. So that's my promise to you. With that, we're going to get to the real, we're going to start with a real good one here. But the, the, folks, in, the folks collecting the cards, you get some questions, you bring them up, because I'm going to have to try to go through some of those. We'll do this. Okay, so, start so with the first question. I think it may have, I don't know what, maybe you would list the conversation on yours as well. I, uh, to Dave, I'm putting a word or two in here, but I'm not changing the content or the meaning of the question. We are now witnessing more and more division and violence in the world, in this nation, and even in Minnesota. What will you, as governor, do to protect and address the division, protect citizens, and address the division in Minnesota, the Minnesota, the security of Minnesotans and their safety? What will you do to address this dramatic increase in division, violence, and angst that we are witnessing today? Is that, so we'll start with Mr. Dean. If you need me to read it again, I'll read it again before we go. Thank you, I got it. It's two minutes? <laughs> yeah. All right. You know, as I said earlier, if you watch the television or pick up the newspaper, you'd think that the state and the country was divided in half with two groups of people that hate each other and want to fight each other. And it's not true. Minnesota is a great state with people who want to move forward together as a state. Republicans, Democrats, independents, everybody. But in Minnesota, we've got a left that has been milit that is so militant that says 
we're going to take what we want by force. And that's not right. It's a small group, a vocal group, that is acting out, and we've got we've to do something about that. And it's not just about politics. It's in the classroom, where we have chaos, where you can't get rid of the kids that disrupt classrooms, you can't get them out. The teachers close the door and they're afraid to go in the classroom because we don't have respect for authority anymore and we don't protect it and we don't stand up and say that that's not okay. In Minnesota, we've got a little bit of a problem with the left in Antifa or whatever they're called in the left wing and they think it's okay. But we need to say if you go out on Highway 94 and you shut it down or you shut down the Capitol, or you shut down the airport, you are going to jail. That's what we need to say. It's pretty simple. We need to have some respect for authority in this state and move people together, but we need some leadership to be able to say what you're doing is wrong. And right now we don't have that. We have a governor that says, if you, t if you shut down the, uh, the freeway, we're not gonna do anything. If you shut down the airport, we're not gonna arrest you. If you jump the, the fence at the governor's mansion, we're not going to arrest you. The governor spent the night at the St. Paul Hotel while his neighbors were being overrun with the left-wing uh, militants. And that's not okay. We need a governor that can stand up for respect for authority, and that's what I'm going to have. Thank you, Mr. Dean. So I actually see two different separate issues here. One is the issue of terrorism or extremism, and the other is the issue of what I would just call crime in the streets. And they're, they're two different things, and they have to be handled two separate ways. So when you talk about terrorism and extremism, the most important rule there is to actually be honest and admit what's going on, which many people are afraid to do because you get called names if you talk about these things. But we know for a fact, this is, this is not a right-wing conspiracy theory. We know for a fact that there are extremist groups that are recruiting young Muslim men in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And they've actually, unfortunately, been successful with a few, and they continue. I believe right now there are five federal uh, uh, prosecutions that are happening. We have to be able to talk about that and address it and try to stop it not ignore it and pretend like it's not happening because we're afraid that somebody is going to be uh, going to call us a name or, or is going to be too sensitive about the whole thing. Another piece of this has to do with who comes into the state. We have to know who's coming into our state and we have to be confident that they have been fully vetted because we can't deal with extremism or terrorism if we have people coming into the state about whom we know little or nothing. And that means that with respect to the refugee program, I believe that we have to pause that to make sure we know exactly what's going on before we move forward with it. The other piece that is not terrorist related is crime in the streets. We've seen a huge spike in violent crime in the Twin Cities in the past year. I'm on the Hennepin County Board and I'm chair of the Public Safety Committee and I'm seeing this up close and personal. We've seen uh, violent sex crimes increase by over 100% in the last year. And homicides, I believe, are up 50%. And this is not rocket science, folks. Enforce the law and put violent criminals in jail. We, we have a long history in Minnesota of being a state that incarcerates few compared to the rest of the country. And I'm actually okay with that if you're talking about nonviolent criminals. But we need to arrest violent criminals, put them in jail, and keep them there for a long time, and that will help solve the problem. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Well, um, as compared to uh, talk and words, let me just describe uh, action. Uh, after the Trump inauguration, a group of Trump supporters held a rally at the state capitol in the rotunda of the people's state capitol. I was invited to speak. I came and I did speak. And not too uh, long before I was actually at the mic, a group of Antifa Democrat protesters stormed down one set of stairs at the Capitol, literally physically assaulting uh, the pro or the uh, supporters of Trump who were there. They tear gassed people, uh, literally came with goggles on. They had black masks and black hoods. You thought you were in the Middle East. And we had to call the police because it was understaffed and Capitol security eventually responded, but it was a horrible scene. Two weeks later, three weeks later, four weeks later, 
we find out that it's Tim Kaine, the son of former vice presidential candidate uh, Kaine, who was part of that group. And Ramsey County and St. Paul were sitting on their hands. So what did we do? We had another rally in that same spot, and we called out Ramsey County and the city of St. Paul. I came down, and guess what? We now have arraignments occurring literally next week for six people who were part of that. And so it's one thing to talk about what we might do or what we could do, and it's another thing to actually stand up and say this is what we believe in and make it happen. A couple weeks ago, we had an Antifa protest down in Hennepin County. They raised the Antifa flag right over Hennepin County. Minneapolis police, stand down. Did anybody say anything? Did anybody do anything? I didn't hear it. The leadership in Hennepin County didn't hear it. St. Uh, Minneapolis police didn't hear it. We have got to match our rhetoric with work, with action, not just words. That is what this campaign is all about. Who actually is going to get in the middle of this stuff and fight with everything they have at their disposal as governor to stop these things? I will. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you. The core of my campaign is, and it's going to be our campaign, is freedom, security, and prosperity. When you come out of this, seeing and hearing the truth from me and what I've been involved with in the last 19 years, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to tell it like it is exactly on the ground, everything that's going on. We are going to end the immigration relocation program. Everything that I got in me, we're going to find a good attorney general and make sure that attorney general gets on task instead of Lori Swanson being so far out of scope. We're going to get on task and we're going to end the immigration relocation program. We're going to expose every single front company, fraud, document fraud company, all these IDs and vital records that are being fraudulent, fraudulently produ produced in Minnesota. They're going to be exposed and prosecuted. We're going to empower our law enforcement. We're going to stand behind them and make sure they have every, all the tools they need and make sure that they're backed up when it comes to press trying to eat them up. We're going to make sure that we tell you the truth about why they're out there and what they're doing. So what we need to do is have the tough conversation in a way that actually gives each other the tools to visit with our family and friends throughout the state. It doesn't turn into an adversarial, uh, violent conversation. It turns into a conversation where you can actually visit with them and say, just hold on a second, back up, and ask yourself a question. Would you tolerate this from someone else? I don't care what, you, what they want to call themselves, Antifa, uh, religious terms, uh, dress in fancy garb, I don't really care. I want to ask you to be honest with yourselves and ask you if you're going to tolerate that from anyone else in your community. Would you tolerate that from your family members? Would you tolerate that from your children? I'm not going to. And we can have the tough conversation, and we can get this conversation straight so that we can protect Minnesotans. A lot of good comments up here. I agree with, I think I agree with every one of them. A uh, couple of comments that I have to sort of close out this question. One, did you know when, when the protesters shut down Summit Avenue and the governor hightailed his butt to uh, St. Paul Hotel and had himself some free room service, did you know that a group called Urban Emerge was, had a number of workers, workers there? Did you know that that group, Urban Emerge, and the workers that they sent were on a program funded by the state of Minnesota. I've been trying to get the media to talk about this. We, th that protest, a number of those protesters that were at the governor's mansion were paid by who? You. We have to look at all of the programs that we currently have from top to bottom. I advocate zero-based budgeting so that we can get to the bottom of these, some of these programs that are completely useless, or better yet, are simply SOPs to pay left-wing organizations to send protesters against common sense values that Minnesotans believe in. Number two, another, another factor we need to work on is training for police officers. We need to invest more in that and for more police officers. And ask Minneapolis, particularly, to actually enforce the law and to train their officers. We're finding more and more out, today it came out in the news again, that that officer who shot the woman a couple of, about a month and a half ago, 
who didn't have training to be on the street, that was in an expedited program. Why? Because he checked off the right, the right, uh, the right uh, type of person. He was a Somali. So we have to have that type of person on the street. No, we have to have trained officers on the street to protect us from the bad guys. His training wasn't there. And the worst part is, he's now going to be going to jail. The woman is dead, and you know who's criminally liable as far as I'm concerned? The Minneapolis City Council and their mayor. And we should hold them accountable. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. We'll start with uh, Mr. Johnson this time. And I'm going to ask this. Republicans have not had a Republican governor since Tim Clinton over here. Well, that's, that number's a little bit off, right? You know that's a little different. So Republicans, uh, since Tim Pawlenty, we've had two terms of um, uh, Governor Dayton. It's been repeatedly mentioned that in order for any Republican to win the governorship, that he or she must also get more votes from CD4 and CD5 metropolitan area of urban core. <clears throat> what is your plan and strategy for winning the governorship in 19? Kind of a two-parter. Do you feel that the Trump victory in 16 will help or hinder you as a Republican candidate running for governor? Uh, I'm trying to decide which one to answer first. I'm going to answer the first one first. There, there are a lot of pieces that will lead to a win for us next year. You gotta work harder than the Democrats, I'll certainly do that. You gotta raise more money than the Democrat, I'll certainly do that. You have to be more organized, and I can say that we're the most organized campaign uh, that we've probably seen in a while, and I probably have the largest database that any candidate for governor has ever had in this state because I started with one from last time and we're already micro-targeting. All of that matters, but none of that will get us to the win unless we choose a candidate who's able to take our conservative ideas and share them in a way that actually pulls in and inspires non-Republicans to vote for us. I ran against a very popular incumbent last time and I, I beat him with independents by 10%. And I tied with independent women, which is unheard of for a conservative Republican. We will not win unless we can take our ideas and make them palatable to people who aren't Republicans. So that's the first half. The second half, with respect to Trump, it's all unpredictable, but I believe he will actually help. And I could give you several reasons for that, but I'll just give you one. One thing that I've been talking about a lot during this campaign, particularly at the fair, is that the DFL party doesn't represent average, normal, everyday Minnesotans anymore. The DFL doesn't care about having a larger middle class. They don't care about health insurance costs. They don't care about transportation. They've got their handful of little fringy far left issues that seems to be all their focus, making sure that illegal immigrants have driver's licenses or Confederate statues or telling people which bathrooms they should use. And that's actually a, a message that is resonating with people. And the fact that Donald Trump has been saying that for a year and a half now and will continue to very loudly, I think will actually be a big plus for us as Republicans in 2018. Thank you, Mr. John. So the first answer is a political answer, and then the second one I think is maybe a bit more of a personal answer. Uh, politically, if you want to win in the state of Minnesota, uh, you have to be a strong conservative that people in greater Minnesota and the excerpts believe is actually going to stand and fight for limited government. You have to be able to appeal to a wide swath of people uh, in the suburbs who are pretty pro-business, but they care a lot about the things in our state. And you have to be able to work well uh, with other people to win their vote. And then you have to be able to win right here in CD4 and in CD5, not a majority certainly, maybe not even a plurality, but you have to do better than we have before. And I think based on my background as a business person for 23 years before going into politics, and my credentials as a solid conservative with a proven track record, cutting spending and reducing debt and finding a way to win while you do it, and the effort that we put in at the state party when we planted our flag right in the middle of Minneapolis and set up our office there and said, there is no place that needs Republican conservative principles more than the urban core. 
And so I think we have a chance in this election and that the efforts that I put forward uh, on all those fronts around the state these last four years, that I'm well positioned to do that. But I gotta tell you, if you wanna win an election in Minnesota as a Republican, you start with your base. We had fewer votes in 11 of the 12 most Republican counties in 2014. And so you cannot make up for losing your base in an election by winning the middle. And we have a chance under Donald Trump, and this is a more personal response, we have a chance under Donald Trump's presidency to appeal to a really wide swath of people and grow our base. I went to great pains to invite the Trump folks into the party uh, when I was party chair. We have a chance if we get out, show the average everyday Minnesotan that we are on their side and we're gonna fight for them, those Trump voters, not Donald Trump, but the people who he gave voice to, they will respond to us. That's our task. We do that, we grow our base, and we'll win. Thank you, Mr. Downey. Mr. Ferris. Thank you. You have to forgive me a minute. I, I, for some reason, I got my mind got off track here for a bit. And I, I'm gonna take 30 seconds of my time. And I, this isn't an insult to any of us. I, I'm not faulting anyone, but can we just take 10 seconds to remember 9-11? Can you repeat the question, please? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Parrish. Thanks, Thanks for reminding us of the I just, I, I had a, I got a thought into my, to, to my thinking here as I was listening to you speak, and it's got me pretty pumped up. Um, no, that's fine. Thank you. So here's the question, to you, Mr. Parrish. Um, and Republicans have not had a Republican. Okay, I, I got, got it. All right. So here's the deal. Oh, here, and it's one of the reasons why I'm so made it, motivated to run for governor. We gotta, we gotta stop and back up and re redo the calculus. The political calculus that I hear over and over and over again, this is a really passionate subject for me because I've been studying this stuff and having to react to it and having to brief and advise commanding officers throughout, uh, in, in, throughout the United States and overseas. We've gotta stop the political calculus that we've been using. Stop it. Back up and rethink it. We are gonna lose this race again if we don't stop and redo the calculus. If we do all these fancy little act, you know, algorithms that, that lead to a certain number of people do this, and certain, we're going to lose. Take a walk outside and talk to these people. You have people in four and five right now. I guarantee you, you're going to overlook them because you think they're Muslim. You think they're overseas. You think that they're something else. They're ready to, to vote with us because why? They've been raped, <coughs> mutilated, and exploited all their life, and they're starting to get the truth because we are out there talking about the truth, not the press. Thank you, Mr. Perry. <laughs> well, I think my opening comment sort of leads you to the answer. I think the it isn't necessarily President Trump that's gonna push Minnesota across the finish line, but it's the attitude he brings. He is not playing the game by the rules that's, that there currently exist. Whether it's using Twitter, which sometimes I think he maybe shouldn't use Twitter, but you know what? He's going around the media. It drives him nuts because they can't control him. He comes in with a different attitude, a different direction. He was so good this weekend with, uh, with the hurricane down in Florida. He is now learning. And I think it's because he's changed his leadership structure a little bit, and he's learning how to be more of a, pre a leader. That's what we need. Someone who's going to be a leader, stand up, not go along and be in, be in the in crowd with the Star Tribune. That's the kind of attitude we need to have here. How are we going to win? I've said it multiple times. If we're going to count on, C on every other CD but four and five to win, we will lose. We have to have a candidate that's going to come into CD4 and CD5 at least once a week, if not more, and talk to leaders and go to a booyah in St. Paul just to be seen. Because you can show them you don't have a tail and you don't have horns. You can show them for the person that you really are. Once you get past that, then you can start to ask them questions, especially in Minneapolis. You've had unilateral DFL control of education for 40 years in, in, in Minneapolis. How's that working out for you? And start to ask those questions that make them think and say, you know what, maybe 
And, and then maybe they'll go home and they'll say, you know what, maybe I'll push the Republican for governor this time. Why? Let's give somebody with fresh ideas a chance. Thank you, Mr. Osmond, again, Mr. Dean. Thank you. First, when you look ahead to say, how are we going to win in 2018? First of all, I just want to start out with a word of, well, first of all, a word of thanks to Mr. Parrish for remembering 9-11. Uh, thank you for doing that. Uh, first, uh, just a note of caution. Don't do what Republicans sometimes do in the past. Don't repeat the mistakes of our past. Sometimes as Republicans, we look backwards and we always want to run the last election again. We're always guilty of running the last election and missing the one that we're in. And that's what we did last time. We have to run the 2018 race for 2018. And it's not going to be a do-over. You can't count the votes from 2016 and say that we're going to get Donald Trump voters and we're going to do this and we're going to tweak that. Because there's no do-overs. But you have to know where we are in 2018. And the people are on our side. That's the good news. The second piece of good news is middle class Minnesota is Republican. Republican values for people who want to work hard, play by the rules, have respect for authority, educate their kids, maybe have a vacation, follow the rules. That's what we grew up with in Minnesota. These are Minnesota values. That's mid middle class values are with the Republican Party right now. And the other side is shutting down freeways, tearing down statues, getting mad, trying to divide people, divide the cities against greater Minnesota, greater Minnesota against the cities, northern Minnesota against southern Minnesota. But I can tell you what, if we're talking about families, we're talking about values, we're talking about jobs, we are going to win everywhere. And I've lived in six different places in the fourth in my life. I know this, I know St. Paul pretty well. I beat Donald Trump by about 11 points in my district, not because I ran against him, but because I ran on my values and what I believe in, and I connected with people in my district. We can do that all over the state. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Thank you very much. Okay, on to the third question. I gotta keep track too. So this this will we'll start with Mr. Downey, and we're gonna start with this will be an issue question. Healthcare is now a major concern for a vast number of people across the nation and, of course, in Minnesota. What would you do as governor to reform Minnesota's healthcare system so it is more affordable and available to more Minnesotans? Minnesotans have options other than being tied to the federal health care <coughs> mandates and regulations. Mr. Downey. Thank you. Well, actually, uh, right before Obamacare, you may remember that health care costs were going up 8, 10, 12, 14. Uh, percent a year, and it caused the uh, momentum that, that gave us Obamacare. And so anybody who stands up here and says, we just need to go back to the way it was before Obamacare, that doesn't work. At the time, before Obamacare, there were a number of initiatives in the state legislature here in Minnesota uh, to reform what we were doing and to extract significant amounts of cost by moving to more citizen, uh, uh, consumer-centric, and patient-centric care models. Literally looked back at them recently with the chair of the Republican Health Care Task Force. I think we could easily save one to two million billion dollars per year if we simply went to a more market-based, indemnity-based coverage model. And there are currently waivers uh, being submitted at the, the Department of Human Services here in Minnesota to do that. So we have an opportunity to re-empower consumers, patients, get them back with their doctors, uh, have them with an independent relationship with their insurance company. There are models that are working and we can pursue them. We can't go back to the old way and we sure as heck can't do what our legislature just did this year. We bailed out Obamacare, folks. For two years, $300 million a year, we bailed it out. They're calling it reinsurance. It's a back-end bailout. It's what we fought in Washington, D.C. It's what Marco Rubio uh, is credited with having shut down in D.C. that the federal government cannot back end bail out Obamacare through, by reimbursing the insurance companies. That's just what we did in Minnesota. And Matt has run around the state uh, telling people that he wants to kill and bury Minsure. The question that remains for all of these legislators up here 
is to come clean and explain to us why you bailed out Minsure. It's going to live for another two years, and now we own everything that happens with it. It was a colossal mistake. We will have our work cut out for us to undo it, but we have to. We have to get to real reforms, not these band-aids. Thank you, Mr. Downey. Mr. Parrish. So we have a wonderful opportunity to talk about telling the truth. Um, listen, I wrote several pieces about the Affordable Care Act back in 2011 and 2012. The bottom line is you had a bunch of bureaucrats and a bunch of illicit companies actually involved in writing policy that simply shifted the investment schemes of one group of very wealthy people to another group of very wealthy people. So we're in this mess because of greed. We're in this mess because of dishonesty. We're in this mess because now, as Minnesotans in our Minnesotan good-natured Minnesota nice way, we can't balance compassion, enabling, and actually helping people. We are compassionate people. We do love people. We want people to be healthy. We want to reach out and help them. But listen, we have a, a, a number of people who are the, the planners and payers, and we have a number of people who are the non-paying, non-planning people. That's never going to change. So we come up with this screwball Affordable Care Act to try and lie to you all about how we're going to cover all of those costs that never get paid for. What are, in, what are the clinic, uh, clinics and providers doing? They can't keep up because they can't figure out what they're going to charge next and they don't know what to charge you because they're busy balancing their books and passing the cost on you, the payers and the planners. So we need to back up. We have some wonderful, really, really wonderful people in Minnesota, because we're running out of time real quick, I'll leave you with this. You have underwriters out there that manage risk, and they manage risk in a way where they absolutely, inside out, know this stuff, forward and backward, how to manage risk. We have wonderful, very smart people out there that can tell you the truth. We need to get them on board, talk together. We can get this through this mess if we stop lying to you. Thank you, Mr. Parrish. Mr. Osmond. <laughs> yes, and we're going to get a little more lively because I will defend what the legislature did. Let's go back in time. In 2013, my first year, we, we went after Minsure. The Democrats were ramming this down the throat. Remember, this is when they had unilateral control. We tried to have genuine reforms included in Minsure to try and put in something to hold back and stop a wave that we knew was coming. I personally had amendments to try and have somebody on the Minsure board that had some healthcare technology experience. Minsure is still a steaming disaster. So the Democrats rammed that through in their first two years. So this year we come in after double digit, this isn't just double digit, 40, 50% increases in the individual market. We created that, the DFL did. We created it as a legislature. And it had gone on over and over and over. So what was I supposed to do? Turn my back on Minnesotans? No. We had to find a solution. We also got market reforms. For-profit insurance companies, truth be told, I work for United Health Group, are able to come into Minnesota to expand the market, bring competition into the system. We dumped, mid, we dumped a program called MSHA into the individual market and completely screwed up their utilization patterns. Utilization patterns means claims. We were responsible for that. We have to be accountable for that. I am proud that we actually helped out Minnesotans to try and stabilize that market. If we hadn't done that, the individual market would be gone. And all of those people that are in the individual market right now would be completely without insurance. So to demonize the legislature now as a, as a Monday morning quarterback, I think is irresponsible. We need to move, though, more towards an individual program. Here's my health insurance savings account, where you can make portability more important. I actually can go to the doctor, pay out of this, because I deposit money into it, and again, have a high deductible insurance plan to go with it. So there's many different ways to do it. We did fix it this year, and we need to continue to work on it, because we caused the problem. Thank you, Mr. Osmick. Mr. Dean. Thank you. Minnesota has and had the best health care in the country. 
Before Obamacare, we had the lowest level of uninsured of any state in the country. We had the undisputed highest quality. We had some of the lowest costs. We had the best doctors, hospitals, clinics, nurses in the country. We had an average of five choices for people who lived in greater Minnesota counties on the individual market. We were then told by uh, President Obama, you can keep your doctor, you can keep your plan, you'll save $2,500 a year. What happened? Well, they lost their doctor, they lost their plan. We now have one or fewer choices in the majority of Minnesota counties for individual health insurance. If I could have our 2005 health care back, I'd take it back in a minute, and so would people who are struggling to try to get their family's health insurance all across the state of Minnesota. I met a guy named Charlie Dunker who, his wife was on Minsure and basically killed her. If you go to my website, you can see their story. His wife was the same age as my wife. When Charlie called me, my life changed forever. There was a line where I said, no more can I put up with this BS that we're getting from this agency. And from then on, I said, I can't tinker with this. I can't change the board. I can't do this. I need to kill it. So yeah, I have a plan. Two steps. Kill it and bury it. Minsure. Total. You know who likes that a lot? People who are on Minsure. County board people who have to deal with this every day. We have a plan that will actually restore greatness in Minnesota healthcare before it's too late, because believe it or not, we still have the hospitals, doctors, clinics, but we won't have them very long unless we act right now. So we can do that if we have the initiative and the political will. With regard to reinsurance, I didn't like it very much either, Keith, that's why I voted against it. Thank you. So there are a lot of ideas I could share with you about what to do about health insurance or, or uh, health care costs in Minnesota. One of them is to uh, work with other Midwestern state governors to create an interstate compact where people can buy insurance across state lines. If the feds won't do it, at least we can do it regionally. And I could give you 20 others. But that's really not the point to most people. They don't want to hear about what our 12-point plan is or a four-point plan is. They don't want to hear that we're going to kill something or they don't want to hear a fight about whether we bailed something out or didn't. We have hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of Minnesotans right now who are scared to death about what they're going to do for insurance, what they're going to do for their parents' insurance or their kids' insurance or their own. And so what we have to tell them is what we're going to do, not how we're going to kill something, but what we're going to put in its place. And it has to be simple. It has to be about more options, more choices, and more control for people over their own families' health care. We have more mandates in Minnesota, I believe, than any other state, at least we're close, because government always knows best. And I think that if an individual feels that this is the best insurance policy for my family, but the ruling class says it's not, the individual wins. And that's what we have to change. We have to make sure that people understand that we're not going to abandon them, we're not going to kill everything that might help them with their own family, uh, but we're going to give them more options, and in doing so, it's going to bring the cost down and push quality up, because that's what competition does. Thank you. Thank you. So this will be the last of four questions. We're doing very good on time. We'll keep it that way. So very good on time. So it's a fairly long question, you might recall. Five. So Minnesota, it was uh, touched on earlier, but Minnesota as a state, uh, uh, Minnesota as a, Minnesota state demographer showed that since 2002, Minnesota has maintained consistent annual domestic out-migration. That is, more people are moving out of Minnesota to other states than people who are moving into Minnesota from other states. It's not just retirees that are moving out of Minnesota, but wage earners in the prime of their careers. This number you might question, but I didn't verify it myself. Out of 5.49 million, uh, million people in the state, almost half are born outside the United States. We can understand that might be people born 80, 90 years ago. That is off the Demographers' website. Born outside the United States. So why is Minnesota unable to retain and grow its domestic population, or to attract more people from around the United States and what would you do as governor to reverse the trend that has been going on now for 15 years? Mr. Parrish. We're going to end the immigration relocation program. 
let me say that again, we're going to end the immigration relocation program. Because that's a big part of the problem. <laughs> Here again, we're caught in this quandary of compassion and decent, loving, Midwestern culture. And then enabling violent, manipulative, dishonest people. Don't call them a religious name. Don't call them into you know, what they're wearing or what they look like or their skin color. You're talking about a violent, manipulative, dishonest culture of all colors and all races and all religions. That violent, manipulative, dishonest culture is causing a problem and we have to confront it. The bigger problem. We have taxes that are leaving the most wealthy. It's not, the numbers are kind of, I, I don't know if I agree with all those numbers. I, I looked that up while, while we were thinking about that earlier this week. The fact is, is you have the wealthiest of the wealthy of Minnesotans moving out and saying goodbye, I'm never coming back. You have the next section of the wealthy uh, just under them that have been figuring out a way to get out of here as fast as possible. <laughs> and then you have their children thinking, gee whiz, mom and dad are leaving. I, I better figure this out because I don't think I'm sticking around if mom and dad are leaving. On top of that, you have, even if you try to come back, the Democrats have gotten us into, the one world order globalist uh, liberals have gotten us into a situation where if you dare come back, geez, you're gonna lose everything and you're not gonna have a place to stay. So we're gonna end the death tax, we're gonna stop all this uh, uh, schemes into every part of your pocket, and we're gonna make sure that you can keep, you can prosper from your own labors and keep your own money and make sure your family survives. Mr. Osbeck. Well, I guess it could be all summed up by come to Minnesota, stay for the winters, stay for the taxes. Uh, we can all talk about the tax structure, but really, I obviously would love to reduce all the tax rates by 10%, the tops rates and the bottom rates by 10%. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do to reduce taxes in Minnesota, but one of the campaign themes that I have is making Minnesota affordable, and it's through regulatory changes. One thing that, we did, that I did and championed through the Senate this year was reducing the cost of energy for Excel rate payers. What comes out of these lights? We were, we were involved with something called the biomass program. We are ending that now. We are getting out of biomass. We have two different facilities, Laurentian and Benson. In Benson, Minnesota, we use turkey um, droppings to fire engines and make electricity at $140 a megawatt hour compared to every other source, which is under $40 a megawatt hour. And the worst part is, we were importing it because Minnesota turkey excrement had to be used for fertilizing fields. We were importing turkey excrement from Alabama. So for every $11 we paid for that turkey excrement to get to Benson, Minnesota, $10 was paid to truck it, $1 was for the actual excrement to go into the furnace to burn. We are ending that, saving you three quarters of a billion dollars in the next 10 years. That's the kind of changes we have to make, is make Minnesota more affordable to you. Today, the Department of, I think it was D, or uh, Department of Commerce, said they're not gonna let us co-locate Enbridge, a new a gas line, or a, a oil line, to help get oil, not on trains, but through nice, safe pipelines. Matter of fact, they said, we want to also discontinue Enbridge 3, which is sending affluence up to North Dakota. The DFL is trying to make energy more expensive for you every day of the week, and we have to stop that. That's what I need to do to make Minnesota more affordable for Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Osmond. Thank you. Well, we have to make Minnesota a place where people want to live, and people want to move here. And, people, and kids want to stay here. My number one project is my oldest daughter. She's 21 years old. She's a junior in college. She's up in Crookston. She's studying uh, agriculture business. And she wants to go to Texas A&M for graduate school. That's a great goal. She's going to do well no matter where she goes. My fear is when she goes to Texas, she's going to look around and she's going to see a state that is increasing in its jobs, it has an upbeat feel, it's moving in the right direction, and it's getting better. In Minnesota, we've got this dour feeling from a business and from government that 
things are always going to be bad and they're going to get worse. We drive by uh, Highway 94, you drive by 3M, and you think, wow, 3M, that's a great company. People used to make stuff here. They used to, they used to harvest things here, make it, and heal people. That's where all our wealth comes from. And we're working against all three. We've got to have hope and optimism for people in the, to want to stay in the state. So kids will want to come back to this state. So that companies will say, I could go there, or I could go there, or I could go to Minnesota. Minnesota has got to be on the top of the list, but it can't be there if companies and employers think that we're out to get them and we're against them. So the first thing is to understand that little things are big things. Little things are big things. And when people are making decisions, they go with their gut and they go with how they think things are moving into the future. We need Minnesota to be a hopeful and optimistic place for families and for businesses. But you gotta reach out and you gotta have a plan. And you gotta have a way of saying, if you invest your kids here, your money here, your company here, it's gonna pay off down the road. We've done that in the past and we can do that in the future with the right leadership. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Dean. Mr. Brown. So, I think what is actually even more important than the fact that we're a net loser state for people every year is when you look at the demographics of who's moving in versus who's leaving. Because in general, the people who are leaving tend to be more successful and tend to pay more into the system, and the people coming in tend to be using the system more. And that means we've got a huge, if we don't already have it, we've got a huge problem. We're going to run into a wall in a short period of time. And that's not, that's not a great sign for the future. And why is that happening? I think there are two pretty simple reasons. Number one, we take too much money from people. I think we take too much money from everybody. Whether you, you you're talking about the income tax or the property tax or simple things like outrageous license tab fees again. Remember when Jesse cut those? They're right back to where they were before. And so it makes it tempting, especially for successful people who are retiring, to move somewhere else. They might not want to, but the bottom line says, why wouldn't I go somewhere warmer where they won't take as much of my money? So that's one reason. And then the other reason is the private sector is not creating the same opportunities here as more successful net gainer states, as they are in those states. And the reasons are multiple. It's our tax structure. It's our own onerous regulatory environment. It's the uh, union atmosphere in this state. And bottom line, we have become hostile to entrepreneurs and to business expansion. And because of that, some of the best opportunities, especially for young people who are graduating from college, are elsewhere. And until we fix that, this problem is not going to change. And that has to be a big part of our next candidate's message. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson. Well, I think everyone here has described the problem uh, in different forms pretty accurately. Uh, we're not only a net out-migration state with people, uh, capital, businesses, uh, personal wealth. Um, you look across the board and the trend lines actually are not in the right direction. And so the question isn't whether can you describe that. The question is, what will you actually do about it? And every single person talked about reducing regulations and reducing taxes. Guess what? You don't do any of that unless you get after what is happening in these mammoth bureaucracies down in state government. You cannot provide tax relief if you don't shrink government. They're two sides of the same coin. Back in 2010, I proposed a bill uh, that reduced the state uh, budget 15% by the year 2015. 15 by 15 uh, was my program. I have committed as governor to find that same 15% reduction in the state budget in my first term. And to anybody who says you can't do it, they have to defend why they think government is 100% efficient and why they think government is doing only absolutely necessary things. There are plenty of opportunities. I had 20 initiatives in that original program and we can do that again. And so anybody who wants to describe the problem ad nauseum without providing an actual solution that allows us to cut taxes, you're never gonna get there. If we do my plan, we will have an $8 billion biennial tax cut ability. We can get rid of the estate tax, we can get rid of the commercial and industrial property tax, we can get rid of that top tier, we can undo everything that the Democrats passed in their $2 billion tax increase, all the punitive stuff uh, out in greater Minnesota, the warehouse tax, the farm equipment tax, we can reduce rates for everybody. 
We can do this, people, but only if you have a governor who's willing to make some really tough decisions, put forward a budget that actually cuts spending. My proposal for a 15% reduction over four years is very doable. And I can tell you, if the Republicans in the legislature send me another set of budgets that raise spending by eight or nine percent, like they did last time, they're gonna meet resistance. I'll propose something even more dramatic lower so that when we negotiate to the middle, which is what they seem to always do, we'll actually get the reductions that we need. Thank you, Mr. Downey. Well, so that ends the, that's the four questions that were prepared that you received. Now we get to uh, some real fun stuff. So I've been going through these questions and trying to collate them a bit. So we're going to start, with, I think we'll have time for two, depends on the endurance of our wonderful audience here. Right, so we'll start with two. And a lot of the questions you've kind of, we've kind of touched on. But this is a little more specific about the Republican Party, and I'm going to add a little note at the end with a note from another question. The Republican Party has often been criticized for being comprised of old, rich white men who support businesses and the wealthy, who are out of touch with the rising, with, who are in touch with others. This particular question goes to millennials. How do you, about addressing millennials, how do you plan to reach this group of voters who may be uninterested in platforms of, uh, of our party and uh, things you mentioned like, like property taxes and choice of schools? So <clears throat> how are you going to reach out to millennials? How are you going to kind of address the rebranding? And <coughs> kind of a larger question there, I guess, is maybe the bottom, maybe you don't want to address this, but why vote Republican? I guess that's kind of what we're talking about here. So I think, Mr. Osmond, we start with you on this one, correct? Well, uh, I'll start out by saying if you think that we're the party of the old white men, have you seen our, our chairman lately? Um, we've elected someone who isn't the same old white guy, uh, with all due respect to the people who ran against her. Um, you know, how do you bring millennials into the party? Well, you first, off by, you first off make them a taxpayer, and then you start to talk to them about what their paycheck looks like under a Democrat versus a Republican. You also bring facts and information to them. You know, millennials, millennials are so, said to love light rail. You start to talk to them about the actual cost of light rail, that the Southwest line will be 20 to $30 million of operating costs every year, that the debt and the cost of building it won't, won't be paid by the millennial. That's gonna be paid by their grandchildren and they're not even married yet. We have to express to them and explain to them for every time you get on a, on a light rail car, it's about, you pay about a buck of costs, six bucks or more by the taxpayer. Do you think that's a real wise choice and wise investment? But lastly, more importantly, it's an, it's, if, if, when you're talking about light rail, it's an ignorance of millennials to say that they like light rail because what do they like? Uber, Lyft, it actually goes, flies in the face of a rigid system that doesn't serve them as opposed to a technology system where you can use your phone and have somebody pick you up. So there's lots of ways we can get to millennials. More importantly, bringing in good jobs by making Minnesota affordable for them and affordable for businesses so that they can invest in Minnesota and bring more jobs. That's what millennials want, are jobs, good paying jobs, that they can, they can live here in Minnesota and be free. Thank you, Mr. Osmond. Mr. Dean, we're on a two-minute time schedule. All right. Well, there's, there's certainly reason to be hopeful with millennials. And I can tell you that you, you, the bad news is that if you read statistics, you'd say that more millennials are approving of socialism than any time in the past. And for that, I think we need to look at our curriculum and teach kids what actually happened before and during, and, and much before, during, and after World War II, particularly in Europe. And I think we have to understand that our kids and what they're learning in school is actually very important, and curriculum <coughs> is extremely important, and history is extremely important. 
But as you look at this group of young people and you think, you know, you're at, the, you're at the bus stop or something and you see a bunch of young people and I'm thinking to myself, which one of you guys is going to do my cardiac surgery in a few years? I don't know, which one of you guys? And you start to talk to them and then I get optimistic when I talk to young people because they are very practical. They grew up, they can't remember, my kids can't remember before 9-11. They grew up in a post-9-11 world. They grew up in a post 2008 crash world where they can't depend on the stock market or their parents or certain things to, to just happen and work out for them. They're going to be resilient and they're going to look to themselves for practical solutions. And if you give them hope and you give them a road map and you give them some work and some opportunity, they're going to they're going to respond. I am more optimistic about younger people today than I am about their grandparents, the the me generation. I think young people today are going to absolutely step up and be our country's greatest generation, even greater than their great-grandparents in the World War II generation, because they're going to have a bigger hill to climb in many ways, and I think they're up to it, and we need to address that. We need to offer them that hope and optimism. We need to offer some optimism for young folks. Thank you, Mr. Dean. <laughs> Mr. Johnson. The first thing we have to do as candidates is get them intimately involved in the campaign. Sometimes we as candidates talk too much and don't listen quite enough. And we have, a, we have a very robust group of upper teens and early 20s involved in my campaign. And they have ideas that I wouldn't have thought of, nor would any paid consultant have thought of in a million years. And so that, is, that has to be step number one. Number two, and this is part of what they can help with, we have to learn to use social media better than we ever have before. And we're starting to do that, I think, in my campaign, certainly far more than any others right now. But we got a long ways to go. And that means that you don't hire the DC firm that says, we know how to use social media. You hire the local kids, I'm 50 now, I can call them kids, who actually have their own businesses and know what works. So those two things are important. And then the third piece is just the message that we share. I was at the fair every day along with a couple of these guys at our own booths. I know I talked to literally hundreds of millennials who came up. And there was a fair share of Bernie Sanders supporters, and they're never going to vote for me. So I'm not going to worry about them. But I would say well over half of them came up and had, they wanted to talk about substantive things and substantive issues. They weren't Republicans, they weren't Democrats, uh, but they, they wanted to know what I stood for and what I was going to do. And what I found was the vast majority of those non Bernie millennials don't trust government, they don't trust big institutions. They want more freedom, they want more choices, they love the sharing economy. All of those things we win on with them and Democrats lose. And so we have to make sure that we're sharing that message far and wide and we're doing it in the way that they actually uh, accept those messages rather than the way that we're used to delivering them. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Dunn. Well, I too am actually really pretty optimistic about uh, the millennial generation. I have three of them uh, in my own family, and I talk to them and their friends a lot. Uh, my observation is that as time goes on, and they are used to literally controlling uh, their entire world through a device at the touch of a button, and they start to run into government at the DMV or the post office or the government-controlled health clinics, and they see the disconnect between what they are used to and what government does, I think we get them on their side. And there's one word that keeps coming out uh, to me uh, from my uh, daughters and son and their friends is they want competence. They watch what's happening. They watch what's happening in Washington, D.C. right now. And I'm telling you, the millennials are not in general big fans of Donald Trump the person, but they watch what's happening and they see the dysfunction and they realize that the solutions are not coming from the political class. They're not coming from the entrenched special interests. They're not coming from bloated bureaucracies. And so I think somebody who can present a competent plan for how we redesign government, how we take them to the next level in terms of their opportunity in life, I think we've got a great chance with millennials. And I remember the week after uh, the election, I happened to have been invited to speak to the college Republicans at St. Thomas. And as I stood before them, all of a sudden it hit me. These kids, young adults, have known nothing other than Barack Obama and Mark Dayton telling them that the American dream is a part-time minimum wage job, or maybe a couple of them, 
and you get your health care and your transportation and your housing and your food and your home heating oil and your child care and your education and maybe even your job from the government, right? That is what they have heard all of their young adult lives. And I told them, be prepared. Be prepared. You have no idea what it's like when an economy grows 3% a year. You have no idea the opportunity. You think you're getting out of school with a fancy degree at St. Thomas and you're never going to be able to use it? No way. Be prepared because when we unleash the economic engine of, of America, you're going to have an awesome opportunity. We go out and pitch that message. I think we've got a great chance with millennials. Thank you, Mr. Downey. Uh, Mr. Parrish? All right. Did you see the victory the other day? I can't remember the name of the school with all the flags in the truck. Yeah? Again, the political calculus is off. No criticism to my colleagues up here, and I hope to call them colleagues. I hope to call them my colleagues when I'm governor. <laughs> the bottom line is, all of us, I'm looking around, this isn't an insult to you, but I'm looking around the room, I'm 52 years old. I'm, I guarantee you most of you are my age or a little bit older, okay? Go to, the only reason I'm so savvy is because of the career that I've had. I've had to learn a bunch of things that I never dreamt I'd learn. Them. Go ask your, your um, well, it sounds like grandchildren, sounds like I'm really insulting you, but go ask your children, go ask your grandchildren, have them help you set up a social media account. I want you to go out there and look at some really good, really good information out there about what's going on with our, with our children. I've been substitute teaching a lot in the last, uh, um, since I've been back from my last set of orders, and I've been pretty bummed and pretty uh, pessimistic about where our kids are at, but I don't know what's going on. Well, I do, but it didn't, I caught, it caught me off guard. There's a bunch of kids out there that have had enough. And they're out there flying their flags with or without a good job, with or without you know, a future in Minnesota. They're starting to get, and Donald Trump, the only time I'm gonna disagree with anybody, I'm gonna disagree a little bit with the, Donald Trump is actually making them really excited. It really is. They're catching on and they're starting to see the truth. They're going around the press and they're going around their teachers. I don't mean that disrespectfully because I'm a teacher, I'm a former teacher. And there's a lot of really wonderful teachers out there, but they're scared to death to tell their students the truth. Thank you, Mr. Parrish. All right. Uh, we have a second question from the audience, and, and if it works out all right, we have a quick bonus question. Right? It'd be a quick one. It's almost a flashback. So, uh, second question, it's a tough one. And Mr. Parrish alluded to it before, but simple issue is there, it's going to come up, I believe, in the campaign. And uh, it'll come up, uh, it certainly will come up in the next uh, many months to the election. Uh, there are people concerned in Minnesota about a refugee resettlement. It's a tough issue, it's a difficult issue. But I think uh, was, there were a couple questions from the audience about it. I think uh, we should. Uh, so we start with Mr. Dean, lucky you. Sure. Well, I can tell you after talking to many, many folks around the state, this is a real issue for people. It's on people's minds. It's on people's minds up in northwest Minnesota. And it might be easy for people to think that this is just something that you have to think about if you're in Minneapolis or you're in Worthington or you're in Wilmer or you're in St. Cloud. Uh, but it's actually an issue that's really come up across the state. And we have to really be honest about what the issues are in terms of what the cost is and in terms of what the communities are facing. And it, de it depends on where you go in the state, but it is a big issue everywhere and we have to be really focused on it. So if you look at St. Cloud, for example, there's a lot of heightened anxiety about it. There's a lot of, frankly, myth truths going around about it, but it's because the people aren't willing to really have an engaged <coughs> discussion about it. If you look at Worthington, if you look around the state at where, where folks are resettling, it causes a, a great deal of anxiety. But then you have folks up in St. Cloud that say, we aren't even willing to find out how much this costs. So if you've got people who have English as a second language, they haven't had health care where they're coming from, they're really coming in with lots of uh, adverse childhood events, some, uh, tough, some really tough situations. But we're, we, we can't even say, 
let's have the counties figure out how much it's costing us in health care, how much is costing us in SNAP, how much is costing us in child care, how much is costing us in additional services and translators. They won't even say that we'll be able to stop that. Steve Draskowski has a bill that says, let's just at least find out so that we know what the costs are. And that has received unbelievable resistance. And that just, that's like common sense. So political correctness is so out of control that we can't even find out what it costs. That's when we're in trouble. I think that's where we should start. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Uh, Mr. John. So, Roger, you said this is a difficult issue, and it is, but it's also an extremely important issue to a lot of people in this state. And some people don't feel it. They don't care about it because it, they don't feel like it affects them. There are parts of this state where this is the most important issue to the people who live in, in certain population centers around the state of Minnesota. And what Minnesotans are uh, so desperate for on this issue is an honest discussion and some leadership from their governor. Because what we've seen from Mark Dayton is if you disagree with me on this issue, you are racist and you should move to a different state. He literally said that to people who were voicing their concerns in St. Cloud about this issue. That's pathetic. And that's not leadership. Uh, I happen to agree that uh, we need to pause, well I'm not sure if that's what you said, but I believe we need to pause refugee resettlement until we know exactly what the cost is. And if the cost is what some people are claiming it is in certain parts of the state, then I don't think we pick it back up again because it's having a very detrimental effect, whether you're talking about crime, whether you're talking about uh, schools, whether you're talking about welfare spending. I think that's the first step. And then showing some leadership, not being afraid to be honest about the issue, and uh, having an honest discussion about it is crucial. I find myself agreeing with my colleagues here. Um, absolutely support a pause in the refugee resettlement program. Uh, I know my church and a lot of churches that you folks belong to are very actively engaged in resettling refugees. Uh, it is the compassionate heart of Minnesota uh, that beats uh, behind this issue. And so we have to be able to delineate uh, between being compassionate and living out that Minnesota ethic and not being taken advantage of. And when you see how upside down our domestic out-migration is, when you realize that literally 35% of the new jobs in Minnesota that have been created since 2000 are in social services and education, you realize that our entire economy and our entire state has become in service of what's going on. And so it is a tough conversation. You'll have business people uh, who need that uh, for their employment. Uh, you'll have large farms and other places uh, that need that for their employment. Uh, but I do agree, we're not having an honest conversation about it. And we're not standing up for the rule of law. And we aren't really tackling, I think, the big issue that everybody conflates with this, and that's illegal immigration. And so I support the president. He's taken some really bold stands. Uh, I support what he's done, uh, putting the pause uh, on these countries coming in, in terms of refugee resettlement. I support what he's doing with the DACA uh, pause, at least, or at least saying he's not going to support the illegal action of President Obama to open up those floodgates. So we need to have an on honest conversation uh, as Minnesotans, and we need a governor, most of all, who is going to support the rule of law in this state. I think if we get back to that most basic premise, a lot of the heat comes out of this conversation. We can let the light in. We can have an honest conversation about what it means across the state, and we can do the right thing as Minnesotans who really care about the long-term future of our state. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Mr. Perry. So we need some tools. We need some tools to get out there and have the conversation. I'm going to share a tiny personal story. This is it's a tiny bit of it. It's a little. It's really personal, and, and I don't want to go too far with it, but. I was a victim of uh, verbal and physical abuse for 17 years. And I'm inside Minnesota in our system, in our way of doing things. And it took me over 17 years to tell my mother the truth. Now, the real asylum seekers, the real immigrants, the real pe people seeking our compassion, they're not speaking up. And they need us. They need us to confront this issue and talk about every ounce of the fraud, the manipulation, 
the mutilation of our little girls. I know it's tough. And I know who we are. I love who we are. But we can do this. We can have the conversation. I'm going to give you the tool right now to go have that conversation. I don't care what your religion was. I don't care where you were from. I don't care what color your skin is. You do not have to tolerate being beat, mutilated, used as a tool to manipulate the government and social services. You don't have to tolerate that. Find them. Privately talk with them. Bring them into the conversation. Bring your family and friends into the conversation. These people are out there. They want our help. And we will expose the ones that are exploiting and abusing. Here's the most insulting thing about the Democrats, and here's another tool you can use in your conversation. If you really cared about people, drop all your sensitivity training crap because you are insulting and mutilating and hurting all over again those abused, mutilated, manipulated, lied to people all over again with your ridiculous sensitivity training. Start telling the truth. Thank you, Mr. Burr. Thank you, Mr. Roger. Well, have you ever seen a firestorm of craziness from when, uh, when uh, President Trump actually talked about reforming a, a law from the 1960s, a law that's as old or older than some of us that are up here? He wanted to actually take on the immigration law and revise it. Make simple changes. That if you're coming and immigrating to the United States, that maybe you should speak English? It's common sense, folks. It's common sense. Uh, we are a big-hearted state. But we have to look at the cost of what the immigration is right now. I would pause that program and find out the cost. Representative Dreskowski is exactly right. We have to find out what costs are being incurred. Are these people coming in and taking jobs and being productive and returning that to our society and making Minnesota a stronger economy? Or are they coming in and receiving welfare and starting a cycle of welfare that we see in Minneapolis and St. Paul that is generational? Is that what we want to do is import and cause more of that? We've seen what happens with welfare in Minnesota. It's generational, it degrades the people that are on it. They become locked in and prisoners of a system that we've created. So, uh, I appreciate Senator, uh, uh, President Trump when he actually stands up and said, we have to look at what our immigration laws are that are 50 years old. It's the right thing to do. Any law that's 50 years old, a half century old, has got to be looked at and seriously looked at to make Minnesota and our country stronger. Thank you, Mr. Osmond. Please hand the microphone to Mr. Jackson with one final question. Now, this is a question I think you all have to be prepared to answer at some point down the road. It's kind of a flashback to, we we'll kind of lighten the mood at the, with the last question here. And, right. Yeah, right, yeah. So, and I would also say that fast food, uh, fast food does not include ice cream, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> so what is your favorite fast food and it cannot include ice cream? Mr. Johnson. Uh, how did you know that that was going to be my answer? Uh, I, would, I would say uh, probably a Big Mac from Don's. Okay, that qualifies. Mr. Don. A Heath Bar Blizzard. That is not technically ice cream. That is an extravaganza. <laughs> I'm not going to let you off that one. I have a little leeway. Real food. Well, I actually like the two-for-one uh, uh, special at Burger King on the Whopper, so. Uh, boy, oh boy, I could do a heck of a promo for A&W. Ten seconds, Mr. Parrish. Ten seconds. A&W, but you stole it, so I can't say it. Um, uh, number four on McDonald's. <laughs> you know the number. You could eat two Whoppers? You're the thinnest guy up here. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, 
chicken wings are probably my, my worst indulgent thing, especially the Asian chicken wings out in Spring uh, Park. We got a little Asian restaurant that does a great spicy chicken wing. Is it takeout and fast food? Yes, it is takeout okay. fast food. In little, <laughs> little white boxes. Mr. Dean. Now that would be a Dairy Queen chili <laughs> cheese dog. Okay. So I'm assuming, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, you'll want to come up and close it, but uh, I'll say thank you again to Concordia College, thank you to uh, CD4 for all that putting this together, and thank you to, uh, uh, of course, the candidates for coming up here and doing this stuff. Again, it's very hard work doing this, it's grueling. And lastly, and most importantly, thank all of you for coming here, paying attention on football night, and uh, listening to the discussion. I think it was lively, and. We started to uh, we started to come out and do some different things. We learned a lot tonight. So with that, what's that? You're right. <laughs> I got too excited about going. I'm sorry. So, so thank you, Mr. Signage, Mr. Chair. You should remind me. Thank you very much. So closing statement. So we started with. Um, <clears throat> Going from, we started with you and we ended with uh, Mr. Parrish. So Mr. Parrish, you go forth, forward with your uh, closing statement. And then I don't have to repeat my farewells again. There we go. All right, three minutes. Wow, what can I do in three minutes? Not a lot. So please get out there and look at the website. If you don't have that website, there's some handouts on the <coughs> table outside. Parish4MN.com, P-A-R-R-I-S-H, the number four, M-N.com. Please take a look. Connect with the social media. Connect with my LinkedIn account, because there's no way that we can do the, the history of, uh, of the career and stuff and what's been going on in my life. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. I thank all these colleagues up here. I hope to call them colleagues soon in the near future. And... Um, uh, they're really a wonderful bunch of, of, of hardworking Minnesotans. I want you to be on Team Parish, and I want you to wear that jersey, and I want you to wear it proud, and I want you to really get out there and fight for Team Parish. But when we get to the, to the state convention, I'm going to ask you. I'm honoring the endorsement pro process 100%, but I'm going to ask you to commit to something as well. You come into that state convention fighting for your guy, fighting for your gal. You come out of that state convention we're in Team GOP. And when we get to the governor's race and we win, we're going to wear Team Minnesota. Okay? So get in there, fight hard, but we got to come out of this convention 100% unified this time. We cannot afford to be fragmented again. It's a promise. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Well, thanks again, everybody, for coming. And we really do have a fantastic opportunity in 2018. We really, really do. The people are thirsty for somebody who will tell it like it is, who will take on the entrenched special interests and really show the people of Minnesota that we are on their side, that we care deeply about them and their families and our state. But this is not easy. You saw what Donald Trump endured and what he's enduring today. We've seen the entrenched political class in Washington, D.C. utterly fail to deliver on the promises that they themselves made in their campaigns and even with their full votes year after year after year. And so this is the conundrum we face. We have a huge opportunity. The people are thirsty for somebody who's going to present a positive vision for the future of Minnesota, but somebody who's also willing to stand up and do the tough work and has a plan to do it. And it's not gonna come from the entrenched political class. It doesn't come from people who vote against bills that pass out of the committee that they chair and are responsible for and hide behind that. It's not gonna come from people who uh, propose, not only negotiate, but propose nine and 8% increases in our state budget who aren't going to accept that the K-12 education budget can grow literally from 13 to 15 billion in five years and see absolutely no increase in results. Somebody who's going to stand up to, say, to that and say, no way. I look forward to the day that I'm debating a Democrat candidate and we have the discussion about school choice. 
And I look that person in the eye and I say, really? Really? 50% of the kids graduating from Minneapolis public schools and you're going to lock a parent with their kids into that school system and almost destine them for failure. We have to go on offense with a positive message, a strong conservative message, and then we have to deliver the results. What we have seen out of St. Paul and what we are seeing out of Washington, D.C. isn't going to cut it. And so this combination of strength and conservative values and standing for that tri uh, tried and true Minnesota ethic and a plan to actually make this stuff happen and somebody who has the will and the skill to make it happen, I'm the only person up here who's actually cut a budget and reduced debt. 50% reduction in the state party's budget, over 50% reduction in the debt, and we won. I'm the only person up here who has actually truly spent more time in business than they have in politics. We have an ability to present a face to the public, to the people of Minnesota, who cares deeply, passionately about our state, who cares for the people, and is willing to do the tough work to make it happen. I think that is a really, really successful formula. I think we can have a great election in 2018, but only if we put forward those kinds of ideas, that kind of toughness, that kind of passion for this election. Then we can get it done. It's not coming from Washington, and it's not coming from St. Paul. Thank you, Mr. Downey. Mr. Johnson. I want to thank you all as well for being here tonight, for everything you do for those of us on the, on the ballot. We stand on your shoulders and realize that we can't win without you and all you do for us. So a sincere thank you for that. I believe the most important job of our candidate for governor is to share a vision with Minnesotans, a conservative vision with Minnesotans, that actually brings in independents and non-Republicans and inspires them to give us a second look and hopefully in the end actually vote for us. Martin Luther King didn't say I have a plan. He said I have a dream, he had a vision. And that's the most important job of all of us. So here's mine, here's my vision for Minnesota. I have a vision of a state where patients control their own health care, and farmers control their own land and entrepreneurs control their own business and where that single mom in Minneapolis or St. Paul who just wants to send her little boy to a safe, decent school actually has the power to do that because we've given it to her. And it's a state where we care more about the individual person rather than the institution or government. We care more about the patient than we do about the hospital or the insurance company. We care more about the worker than we do about the company or the union. We care more about the kid than we do about the school. That's an argument I hear all the time. And it's a state where the American dream is alive and well because any Minnesotan who's willing to work really, really hard can find a meaningful middle class job that allows them to provide for their family. And finally, my vision for Minnesota is a state where we have ended this bitterness and envy over income differences and this belief that the poor are poor and the rich are rich and all you can really do is just redistribute wealth. And instead we are celebrating people who are successful and we are never ever giving up on people who are poor and we are preaching every single day a gospel that the poor can become the middle class and the middle class can become rich and anyone who starts with nothing can still achieve anything in this state. That's my vision. That should be our mission as Republicans, and if it is, we will win next year. So I ask that you join me in the fight to put the people in charge again in Minnesota because that is how we will return freedom and opportunity and prosperity to everybody in this great state. Thank you all for everything you do, and I hope to earn your support. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Roger, and thank you for doing a super job moderating tonight. Awesome job work. Awesome work. And thanks, to everybody, again for being here. Uh, I would encourage you to really get involved in the 2018 gubernatorial election. It is going to be the election to be involved with uh, statewide because we are going to help every single other person on the ballot in Minnesota this time around. Uh, every, if, uh, I don't know if there's House candidates who are still here. I can't really see into the back. Uh, but what a House candidate can do is you can knock on every single door in a district. 
I can't do that statewide, but we can work together and we can really take this state in the right direction. We can engage different groups of people and new people so that we can actually win on election night again. And we can bring people together with a hopeful and optimistic message that really works for Minnesota. And it's focused around middle class values, family values, and work. That actually does sell with people. You don't have to work that hard, especially when the other side is tearing down statues and out on the highway and getting into everybody's face and telling them that they're so bad. We have a hopeful and optimistic message and it's one that we will win on if we have the right messenger and the right message. We can do that if we come together in 2018. I believe we can. Our final campaign as we start out of, out of our Duluth, it will be on June 2nd. We come together united as a party. It's gonna be great to win again in Minnesota. And we should do that based on what we're gonna do when we, when we win. Not we're good, they're bad, we're smart, they're dumb. We're Republican, they're Democrat, us and them. It's gonna be about the people who vote for us, we the people. And that message is gonna catch on and it's gonna be fun. I encourage you to check out Matt Dean for governor, Google it, jump on. We are having the funnest time imaginable. Laura and I just are having the time of our lives uh, recruiting people out there, getting new energy from all over the state. It's super fun. If you haven't engaged in a gubernatorial race, I encourage you to do so. I encourage you to give money to the 4th Congressional District and to your own BPOUs for first, and then pick up one of these uh, guys out here and help us if you can as well. Uh, but please continue the work, and really thank you, thank you, thank you for everything you did last time. Thank you in advance for the work ahead. 2018 is gonna be an awesome year in Minnesota. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Mr. Well, I could be really short and say Vikings 26, New Orleans 12. Good night, everybody. <laughs> but I'll use a few more minutes than that. Thank you for being here tonight. Why? Because you took this very seriously on a night that you could have stayed home. You could have just had a pizza and watched the game and had a beer. Uh, but you came here. We do appreciate that. Uh, I want to just say that uh, I will be an endorsement candidate. I will support the endorsee because if I'm not your endorsed candidate running for governor, I get the opportunity to stay as a Minnesota State Senator, which is a great job and I thoroughly enjoy doing it. But we have to have a person who has the passion to take our message out. It's not angry, it's passionate. And we have to go to the door and explain why are the Republican values the values you can believe in? Because we believe in you. We believe in a smaller government. We believe in taking less money from your pocket. All of those values that we all came together as, as a party, are the values of the majority of Minnesotans. I'm firmly committed to, I know that that's what it is. We are going to win, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, we are going to win in Congressional 4 and Congressional 5. Why? because it's the richest place for us to get a 5% change in votes. All we gotta do is claw away a little 5%. Five out of 100 people who would normally vote come our way, we win. And then we can truly get to the business of changing Minnesota. Not just working around the edges, but changing Minnesota. Among the candidates here, we're all, we all really have about the same viewpoints with some small modifications and some small eccentricities. But you have to look at what candidate is going to stand up and believe in the party's principles, your values, and can take it to the Democrats in November. Again, thank you for being here, and uh, let's go win in 2018. Thank you, Mr. Oz. Uh, Mr. Chair, did I forget anything? Did I forget anything? I think I've covered everything now. So, so one last thank you, though. Thank you to our wonderful timekeeper in red up here, keeping them all on. So, Mr. Chair, you want to come up and say a closing word? So, again, thank all of you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Chamberlain, for moderating our forum tonight. And we want to thank all the candidates for.
being here tonight and for answering the questions. And we wish you well on your campaigns and whoever may be the uh, person that does uh, earn the Republican endorsement, we, uh, we believe and we will support that person. Um, one thing, uh, just kind of in closing, what does, and you may not be aware of, what does a congressional district do? And I'll just take 30 seconds to say, uh, basically it's real simple. What a congressional district is supposed, supposed to do is to support and help a Republican endorsed candidates win elections. So that's what we're doing. Uh, we're doing that with the governor candidates. We're doing it with the House candidates that are coming up for election in 2018. In Congressional District 4, we have 21 House seats. Uh, currently, we have only seven Republican uh, legislators that are in the House. So we're working on picking up more seats there. We're looking also at uh, supporting and endorsing and recruiting uh, candidates or a candidate for running for federal office against Betty McCollum, who's been in there way too long. And then we also are looking at supporting and endorsing and helping a candidate get elected uh, for the constitutional offices, attorney general, uh, state auditor, and secretary of state. So I'd like to encourage you to become involved in one or more campaigns. It's, a, it's work, but um, someone has to do the work, so we would encourage you to do that. And then also, we'd also like to encourage you to uh, put your money into a campaign, whether it's the governor's campaign, whether it's a house, whether it's a congressional district. Uh, we'd encourage you to put your, your money in, into a campaign because it takes a lot of money to, uh, to run a campaign and win an election. So with that in closing, uh, thank you again, candidates. Thank you, Senator Chamberlain. And uh, thank you, all of you, for attending tonight. We hope you got a lot of good information out of it. Um, we're not going to take any speeches from other people tonight. This is strictly a, a governor candidate forum. So there are going to be other events around the state, around the district, for, for other speakers to, uh, to talk at. But thank you again for coming out and finish right on time. Okay.